letsthinkshow.com. Welcome to the Let's Think Show. This is Shepard, the Voluntarist. And on the line today, I have a friend and fellow philosopher, Patrick. Patrick, how are you doing today? I am great. It's cool to talk to you. Every time I talk to you, it makes me, I, I leave happier than before I, came, before I showed up. So I'm looking forward to this. Well, same back at you, and it's it's so neat in this this movement that is somewhat new in the last years that it's become popular. Uh, it's so neat to know other people that are really thinking and pushing us, you know, pushing my thoughts and making me think harder. I, I think that's pretty awesome. Um, and so I know a bit about you, but for my audience, uh, are you a family man? Do you have any any wives or children? <laughs> <laughs> I have a wife and um, a small gaggle of children. Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. Perfect. And by the way, folks, uh, if you have not already seen a video, uh, we were at a convention. Uh, Patrick and I were at the same convention recently, and he did a talk. Uh, and later we'll give a website that he has this talk on. Uh, Patrick and I have something uh, kind of in common, we we both have, uh, or I had a daughter. He has a daughter that had cancer, and fortunately, his is his situation is turning out much better. What was your awesome news just in the last week or two, Patrick? Well, we did the ceremony where it's called ringing the bell, where they take us sort of uh, into a private area of the hospital, and they have a plaque on the wall with a bell that you get to ring when you complete treatment. So. We have been about a year and a half without a positive leukemia test. So it's pretty good news. That is awesome. And how old is she? Uh, she is five now. Five. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, and how long have you been a voluntarist? Oh, uh, I feel like coming up on 10 years now. Yeah, I think so. I think I'm about okay. to hit my, my decade. Yeah. Right. Get your plaque, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, what, what do we have, a golden watch? Or I don't know what we do uh, in our in our little tribe, but uh, well, that's, that's, that's a good long time to be in it. Um, today, I thought that uh, Patrick and I might chat about the island analogy. And the island analogy is something that Larkin Rose, who is a uh, very important person in the the libertarian movement uh, that he's spoken about in the past. And he just kind of puts up a scenario and then we try to figure out some good ways to go from there. The reason that the island analogy is important is because I think too often when I'm arguing with somebody or dialoguing, uh, we're, we're kind of midstream, and we're already down this track of, you know, we've been a hundred years of being forced by the government to do this thing and having our taxes taken. And it's hard to imagine what a, maybe a better way could be in our current paradigm. So it's kind of fun sometimes to step out of it and see what's going on. Um, so let's kind of go through this. And so the, the rough idea is there's an airplane flying along and it crashes into the ocean uh, beside a uh, tropical island. And we'll just say it's a one section. It's a mile by mile. And 150 people survive. We don't know how long we're going to be there. Uh, but we we'll figure it'll be at least a while. So we, we kind of have to get ready for that. <clears throat> what is the place, Patrick, where the airplanes disappear and they, uh, Bermuda triangle. Uh, yes. Bermuda triangle. So we're going to say that that's where this happened. And so 150 of us have made it onto the Island. Uh, and, uh, I kind of jotted out just some characters for this. Do you have those, uh, in front of you, Patrick as well? Yes, I do. And just, just to be clear for my audience, you know, we talk about some nerdy philosophy stuff on my channels quite a bit. And I'm sure that some of them are going to be watching this. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that I, I have my own scenario that we use called the Island versus the city. That's not what we're talking about today. This is something totally different and really cool that Larkin does. And yes, I do have your notes pulled up in front of me. I just wanted to clarify for, for my, for my nerds, you know, <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. And you know, folks, uh, those of you who are listening, if you kind of get into our our group, our tribe, our our group of friends, the voluntarists, you'll kind of find that there are a lot of us are nerds. You can almost go to a convention and ask a person, you know, what what kind of software engineer are you, and uh, what new <laughs> app do I have to download because all of the other ones suck, and you'll be told the answer to both of those. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, since I'm odd, uh, I will. We have ten different characters here, and we're just going to real quickly go through these and kind of set the stage for a fun story, and then we're going to work through some problems. Uh, why don't I take the odd ones, Patrick, and uh, maybe if you want to tell people about the even ones. Sure. So, uh, so first, maybe just headline yeah. it with like, "What is the purpose of this analogy?" Right. It's it. The purpose is to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, the purpose is to sort of like illustrate uh, how uh, a free society or a voluntarist society would solve various problems, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the idea is we always, when we hear somebody saying, Hey, what if, uh, what if we didn't have any taxation? Then somebody's going to say, well, how would you pay for stuff? And since we are caught midstream, this is just kind of a, a little thought experiment. It's imperfect. It's, you know, it's not perfect, it's, but it kind of gives us an idea of how maybe a society might organize itself. Yeah. That's a good point. Cool. So, dude number one is Murray. Murray is blind, uh, but he, he winds up here on the island. He finds a stick, and he uses rocks or whatever, and he sharpens it into a sharp point, and then he holds it over the fire and dips it in water or whatever to really harden it. And Murray, blind Murray, ends up with a nice little spear. Okay, uh, number two. And this this stuff is kind of new to me. I'm not an, I, I haven't played with this scenario much, so I'm looking forward to this. And number two is Sherry, who is a medical professional. She finds some aloe vera plants on the island uh, that she can use to treat sunburns. And she also finds other plants to help with other medical issues. Perfect. And then we've got Jesus. And Jesus is a great carpenter. Uh, so as soon as he's there on the island, he finds some driftwood and bamboo and and I guess the whatever kind of sinewy plants. And he's thinking about how he's going to make a hut out of these things. So he has some shelter. And then we have Pam, uh, who is relieved that at least she won't be getting arrested for an outstanding check fraud case that she has pending while she's on the island. So she's actually Good probably old. the only one happy to be there. Right. <laughs> she's the only one. Hey, she's finally safe for the first time, she thinks. <laughs> uh, next, we have Reardon. And Reardon is an honest guy, but he's really greedy and he's very self centered. And it turns out he's a really handy fisherman. All right. And then we have Big John, who plans to use his time on the island to get into even better shape and to practice his katas. Hiya! He's going to become a real hardcore dude. And then we have Fat Tony. And Fat Tony is always looking for a deal. He's a wheeler and dealer. He's looking to broker stuff. And he didn't know how to fish or anything like that or build a hut, but he's really good with numbers. And then Grandma Clarice, who enjoys being motherly to everyone. And and folks, just so you know, we're making this up. My late grandmother's name is Clarice. So that's how that came up. So I think I won't be getting sued by her for uh, defamation of character or anything. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, this next person is Joey. And Joey is a pedophile. And that's all I've got to say about that disgusting piece of crap. Gross. The Johnson family is a large one full of hardworking people with good intentions, but not much creativity. <laughs> So now we have our 10 characters, and we've got another 140 people on this island, and we think, okay, what's going to happen right off the bat? Uh, what are some of the things that could go wrong that we might need a government? And it's easy when we look at something like the, uh, was it Little House on the Prairie? How noticeably absent one organizational type was. And that's because the Lane family had a good number of anarchists in them. And uh, Little House on the Prairie had no government people involved. But then we think about it and we say, wait a minute, how would that really work? Well, that's why we have this island analogy. So who did I say was a fisherman? Was oh, it, let me uh, find it. Reardon. John, Reardon. No, yeah, Reardon, yep. Yeah, Big John is our protector security dude. Uh, and then, I, yeah, Reardon is the fisherman. And, uh, you know, somehow I guess he's wound up catching a fish or two or three. And Pam ends up stealing a fish because nobody's accepting her checks on the island, I guess. <laughs> so she steals a fish. What do we do with Pam? Like, if this was really truly, we were on the island, what do you think? Well, I, I think you just, you, you, it's kind of slipped something in that was really important to this entire scenario. No one would accept Pam's checks on the island because they knew about her history. She had a reputation for fraud, for not being honest in her dealings. And so people 
refused to take her at her words. And that left her in a state of hungriness that she had to find a solution <laughs> to, right? Yes, and that's a good point. And rather than doing what I think other 149 people on the island would say is a a, a good thing that's maybe maybe a, uh, a universally preferable behavior, which would be not stealing, she chooses to steal something. And so when we think about well, what would happen to her, uh, I don't know. If she stole my fish, I'd probably grab it back. I'd yell a lot because if you're taking a fish from a woman and people didn't know what happened before, they might come up and beat me up. But if I said, hey, everybody, Pam stole my fish and I grab it from her, uh, I think that would be a pretty good resolution for this first time. And I'd probably yell at her and say, hey, don't you ever do that again. Yeah, you know, I'm used to having like super nerdy philosophical conversations about how the how the equations of ethics works in these situations. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is if if she thinks it's okay to, you know, use force or to initiate force in a situation to take your property, then she cannot complain when you do the same thing back to her to retrieve your property. So, yeah. We will talk more about fish thieves and such with Patrick uh, here on the Let's Think show. After the break, we'll get right back to our island analogy by Larkin Rose. Most of the theft, assault, and murder in the world is committed not by individuals acting on their own malice, but by individuals obeying the orders of governments. The worst atrocities in history were legal and were the result of a very small number of truly nasty people acquiring positions of power, combined with a very large number of average people who viewed those few people as authority and felt obligated to obey their commands. It has been the law-abiding taxpayers who have funded and empowered every oppressive regime in history. No, the belief in authority does not make people good. Instead, it tricks otherwise good people into tolerating or even proudly condoning legalized injustice. Let's think show.com. Let's think show.com. And welcome back to the Let's Think Show. We are going to continue our conversation now with Patrick Smith of Disenthrall. We've been talking about an island analogy, which is something that philosopher Larkin Rose came up with. And we're just kind of yeah, trying to figure out how we would deal with certain things. In this case, we've been chatting about a woman who stole a fish. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is if if she thinks it's okay to you know, use force or to initiate force in a situation to take your property, then she cannot complain when you do the same thing back to her to retrieve your property. So, yeah. Yeah, it seems like we kind of have a, a little bit of a resolution there. Now, I guess if she continued to steal it, then we'd have to think about some equivalent to a uh, contemporary concept of a jail or a prison. Maybe we have to take her and keep her away from one place somehow. But I, I don't know that I would want I don't know that I would want to chip in at this point. She's stolen one fish or a couple of fish. I don't think I'd want to start spending 80 grand a year to have her housed and boarded. Also, like a proportionate response is important, right? So, you know, other people on the island, if they see you go and, you know, severely injure her or, you know, respond in some way that was sort of out of proportion to the loss of a fish. Um, you know, that could be bad for you as well. And and that's one of the things that's important is like a proportionate response. Um, also, there's like there's a common law concept. And Walter Block talks about this really well in a book called Defending the Undefendable 2. I think it was the second one of those books uh, where he talks about like common law, crime and justice and restitution being usually 2x the damage done. So if she took one fish from you, then you getting your fish back is half of the justice and the second half of the justice is you doing to her what she did to you, which would be to take the equivalent of another fish. So in, a, in that way, it keeps it from being a zero sum game for the thief, right? Because if the thief comes and takes your fish and all that happens or all that she is risking happening to her is having the fish taken back. Well, there's nothing to stop her from just trying to take it again. And maybe she gets away with it the second or third or fourth time, right? 
But uh, if there's an additional cost, then there, there's a deterrent in there as well. That is brilliant. Yeah. And I think if you were explaining that rather than right now on the radio, if you were explaining that around our campfire on the on the island, I think I would say, geez, that makes sense. And I have a feeling that a lot of other people would also say, you know, that's that's that seems right. Shepard, I think that uh, Pam probably owes you another fish. Uh, that that makes good sense. Um Okay, let's find another problem. How about we, we've talked about some crime. We've talked about theft. Let's look at another issue that is, is big in the world today. People are concerned about pollution. What if one dude, um, I think I introduced a dude that I didn't introduce in the first place. But anyway, some guy goes, uh, Donnie goes upstream and he poops in the one clear water little creek that, or river that we have running out to the ocean. What would be a, a proportionate, properly proportioned response to that uh, this is a this is a super complex problem when you're talking about like uh, normal everyday modern life not on the island you know where there's all sorts of interest there's hundreds of people living along the river benefiting from the river but in this situation it's pretty simple right you feel like i think you generally would have this mindset of well this guy is hurting the collective but the the collective scenarios, uh, when, when you think about people collectivized in this way or collectivizing resources, like the tragedy of the commons of the river, like which of the 150 people has the right to tell anybody what to do with this thing that none of them owns? Uh, well, okay, what are they all just supposed to vote or something on who has control of the river? Or, you know, are they supposed to vote on standards of cl- standard poop levels? for the river and, <laughs> and elect somebody to, you know, test the poop level at each spot in the stream, you know, stuff like that. Um, those tend to be the worst solutions, I think. Yeah, that that's true. Cause you can imagine if, if the, if we all formed the environmental poop agency, <laughs> uh, we have some EPA thing, like there'd be a real, a bunch of real idiots if you had an organization like that. No, yeah. They wouldn't really make things work well. So, Something that Larkin Rose has talked about that I just love is kind of correcting what I said before. And I said, what would we do about Donnie pooping in the river? Well, maybe the proper question is, what would I do about Donnie pooping in the river? What would you do, Patrick? And maybe it's an individual thing. And and if you went up to Donnie and said, hey, man, uh, we've all got to drink this water, uh, do us a favor and poop downstream from now on, or actually go out in the jungle behind a tree. Uh, As a matter of fact, everybody cool with being like 100 yards away from here? Um, As a matter of fact, if everybody's not 100 yards from here, I'm going to come give you a, what's it, a nookie or whatever, where you scrub the person on top of the head. Uh, You're endangering my life, so I'm going to respond and protect myself by doing something unpleasant to you. All, there's all sorts of ideas that come to mind. First of all, I see um, I see a sudden market need as an entrepreneur. You know, we have a guy doing something that uh, a lot of other people don't appreciate. Why is he doing that? Well, let's examine that as sort of an entrepreneur. What problem is there being so? Is there to be solved here? Perhaps we go to the end of the stream, the very end of the stream before it meets the ocean, and we set up a an outhouse that uh, other people can trade with us for the use of to give them a positive solution or a positive option to uh, prevent the conflict. Maybe another idea. I like that. Maybe another idea. I got tons of this stuff, man. I love thinking about it. So maybe, maybe another (laughs) idea is like, you know, I section off a part of the river and I'm like, Hey, okay, this is going to be my part of the river that I use to serve my water needs and my fishing needs and my, you know, whatever. Um, and then if somebody poops up, you know, uh, upstream of my section of the river, well, now they have polluted sort of my property. I take ownership of that piece. I keep it nice. You know, uh, I keep the, the, the wildlife trimmed or whatever away from it, the, the foliage. Uh, and you know, then, then I, we're going to have a problem if you start polluting up my section of the river. Um, and you know, then I would be able to justifiably take steps to prevent that from happening. Yeah, that that makes good sense to me. I I like that one conch shell per poop. Uh, that'll be the fee to use the outhouse. But I love that idea. If there's a problem, an entrepreneur will come up with a solution, and uh, it'll, it'll make it work. And, and uh, I mean, you, you, the the group could think of all sorts of you know reciprocal justice for that. Maybe maybe he only gets to drink from downriver. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like that. Well, and you know, that that's a good point too. Like, I don't think that the ideas we're coming up with spontaneously today are going to be the best ideas that could ever come out of these questions. Mm. Like people who are listening right now are thinking, ooh, how about doing this or that? And there's a good chance that those ideas are better than ours, Yeah, which to me seems like maybe that's a good argument that neither of us should be appointed emperor or governor of the island or whatever, because maybe our ideas aren't as good. Well, here's what the government they, would do. They would, they would, what would uh, they do? They would not elect, they would choose uh, a group of people to form a council of water quality. The council would then have sort of an inverted uh, incentive to make sure that there was always at least a little bit of pollution in the river. Otherwise their jobs would become unjustified. Oh, Uh, yes. Otherwise they wouldn't be needed anymore. And then they would, you know, just to make, to make it look like, or to assure people that they were actually doing something uh, in their job on the council, they would have to make a long list of very complicated rules that only they were uh, familiar enough with to adjudicate. Um, You know, once this thing was created, it would literally never go away. And eventually they would need to tax people so that they could actually pay for the number of employees they needed to continue monitoring the river. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And neither of us came up with that idea. Interesting. Maybe it's a really bad idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we didn't come up with the idea of, Hey, let's steal a fish from everybody and force Jesus to build huts for (laughs) a person so that that person can solve this problem. Like, no, let's just solve it. This is what I do. That's a, that's a good solution. Okay. My grandma Clarice collects a bunch of bananas and she makes some banana bread and she shares it with everyone. Well, I guess that's not really a that's a problem. A problem. Okay. That's not a that, that sounds to me like a pretty good thing. I I wonder if if the one of the reasons for that is because she's an old lady grandma and she's taking something that she's good at, nobody's forcing her to do it, but she says, "Hey, I'm really good at Making banana bread. I would love to to share it with everybody. I wonder if there'd be a lot of goodwill if nobody was using force against each other. I bet Reardon, uh, even though he was greedy and self-centered, uh, might see that as a good thing and maybe toss her a fish once in a while. <laughs> you know what? I think a good turn like that might just bring about more good turns. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then uh, kind of speaking of exchange stuff, um, uh, mediums of exchange. Like how does Reardon give somebody else something uh, if, if she doesn't really need the fish, but she needs a hut, but Reardon wants to trade her for an extra loaf of the banana bread um, or Jesus wants some fish, but he doesn't know how to fish. And Big John gets a splinter and he can't get it out, but he knows that, uh, what's her name? Uh, Sherry. Uh, Sherry is a medical person she's probably able to get the splinter out but maybe she doesn't need a fish either or a hut maybe she needs protection well who is it that our protection guy is big john so it's kind of like how are we going to barter with each other yeah i mean what what you're kind of alluding to is money right so uh if it's a little bit challenging to envision money with only 150 people uh, because you'd think you know probably you would just have to sort of like, I don't know, pick coconuts or something. <laughs> that, something that everybody valued a little bit would be a good option for money on an, on an island scenario. Uh, I don't know what that would be, you know, cans of water, firewood. I don't, I don't know what the, the monetary currency might be. But yeah, you would, you would probably trade in something that everybody valued a little bit. Yeah, I, and I think that there would have to be some... You know, if it was, I think about something bigger, like if they found some wild boars and, uh, you know, somebody ended up with 15 wild boars in their their meat cellar, um, that isn't really something that, you know, one person doesn't need to trade the other for two of those. But it would be neat to have some symbol, some way to communicate that value. And that is kind of how money came about. We needed this thing that represents and is good to trade in for things of real value. And I I think we can't confuse it with the money, the Federal Reserve notes we use today, but real money. Let's think show.com.
We've been speaking with Patrick Smith of Disenthrall, and we're going over this analogy, this island analogy that Larkin Rose came up with. And we're trying to figure out, you know, if we were in a, a little bit different world, how would we make things work? And we've been talking about how would we, uh, how would we come up with money? Is money necessary? Is that what we would need to exchange things of value for other things of value? And we talked about, you know, if one person had a bunch of wild boars, how would you trade those uh, for somebody removing a splinter from your finger. And so let's get back into it uh, right here on the Let's Think show with Shepard the Voluntarist, that's me, and Patrick Smith. Uh, what else could be used on an island? Uh, well, money represents value. And when you make a trade, you're trading value for value. And uh, it doesn't matter. Like, it would be really hard to carry around a boar on your back you know, as you went through the market and like, okay, I'll, I'll trade you a, a quarter of this boar for a fish and, uh, you know, some fish and I'll, I'll trade you another quarter of the boar. And maybe somebody's like, well, no, a quarter of the boar. That's, that's not much. I want, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, three eighths <laughs> of a boar, you know, it's like, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, so, uh, you know, it, it helps to have a, a fungible currency, um, a fungible divisible currency which are just fancy words for, you know, something that can divide value down into small chunks that, uh, you know, every bit of which is sort of valued equally. So like my dollar for, to put it in dollar terms, right? Like my $1 bill is worth the same to me as your $1 bill. And the individual item is, is not important. So I, I don't know what that would be on an Island scenario. I think this is a tough one for, you know, only yeah. 150 people. Yeah, and I wonder at what point, I don't have an answer for this, I wonder at what point a group of people, it would get too complex. Like if there were only two separate parties, you wouldn't need money. Uh, three, you'd still probably get along without. And I wonder at what point it would be handy. I don't know. But the conch shells I mentioned, I don't know when this was, but thousands of years ago, they were actually used as a medium of exchange. I think on the African continent, somewhere over there, they they used conch shells, and that was their store of value, even though the shell itself wasn't worth that much. Everybody agreed. Well, everybody that wanted to agree that it would be worth it uh, would. As we've kind of looked at these issues, we haven't addressed everything, obviously, because society is complex. But I don't know. I kind of, I think that after the show, I'm going to really try to think of other problems that come up in society. What, like, what are some of the uh, reasons that you've heard well-intentioned people say, hey, you know, you're suggesting that we don't have a government. This is a problem. What, what other things am I missing that you've heard people say or government's needed for? The number one of, of objection is uh, the warlords. So without a centralized justice and protection system, um, ah. then you're going to get, you know, maybe one of the guys on the island. Let's see who's, who's probably most likely to, uh, to do this. Not, not grandma Clarice, probably not. Yeah. She'll, she'll uh, probably be good. Now, big John is a big, tough martial arts dude. Yeah. But if he's good enough to be in martial arts, he's probably has enough discipline. He's not going <laughs> to be a knucklehead. <laughs> yeah. So maybe one of the 150 people starts figuring out that, um, you know, if he bullies people, he can start to get away with it um, in the short term because he's tough. Or maybe he's got a small group of friends that, uh, you know, kind of work together to defend themselves. And so, like, the, the warlords argument kind of comes from here, right? Without, without a centralized, a forcibly monopolized uh, group of defenders, i.e. the police, then you're going to have, um, you know, warlords develop. There, there will be people on the island that will force sort of their will onto everyone else. Well, on this island analogy or example we're thinking about, what could be a, I don't know, what could be a solution to that? If, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say Pam and, uh, Who's the guy? Donnie. They're the kind of the two bad guys we've talked about. Uh, Pam and Donnie stop stealing fish and writing bad checks and pooping in the river. And they decide <laughs> to start being bully warlords. What would you do? Well, you and I, we're both big guys, so we kind of know what we would do. But what would poor Clarice do? 
I mean, th- that's just it. They they would need um, uh, other people to help them um, gain some kind of protection. Uh, and you would want to find people that could protect you without becoming sort of warlords on their own. And so the, now you have, again, we're back to being an entrepreneur. How, as an entrepreneur, do you solve the market need of providing protection from people, but also part of the market need is some kind of guarantee that you're not going to turn into a warlord yourself once you sort of amass resources from people like that is a market need with a, uh, an obstacle. And that needs to be part of your sales pitch to me. Cause if I'm Clarice and somebody comes up to me and is like, Hey, uh, I'll offer you, I'll offer you protection. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Benny. (laughs) I'm going to be like, well, I'm not going to sign up for your service. Uh, unless you can sort of, maybe we have a third party that, that gets to watch what you do or follow, follows you around. And maybe you have to put up, uh, you know, a thousand conch shells or whatever <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, as some kind of bond, security bond or trustworthiness bond. And you lose that money uh, the moment this third party evaluates you to, you know, maybe going down a bad path or becoming a threat yourself. Right. That That sounds like a a good possible solution. Cause I don't think, I, I think Clarice would really want to watch out and make sure that all of a sudden, whoever offered to give her protection didn't start coming and stealing her bananas and the fish that she gets, or at least a portion of them and saying, no, I'm stealing these from you so I can survive and stay strong so that I can protect you. Because that's kind of a, I, that's silly and ridiculous. I know, but she'd probably want to make sure that didn't happen. Um, so yeah, that this sounds might- like a, Tell me if you th- if you agree or not. Maybe I'm wrong, but this sounds like a, another weakness of the small number of people in an island situation. Like, if you scale this up to to you know something like a state or a country size number of people, um, you're you're always going to have far less sort of bad guy gang members than you are. Like the ratio of bad guys to normal people is going to be much different than it would be on an island of only 150 people. So like if 10 of the people on the island banded together, that ratio is a lot different than it would be in real life uh, in a real state of existence, right? Right. Well, that is a good point. I'm going to flip, switch, flip, whatever. I'm going to do something to the gears. Uh, What do you think, (laughs) completely separate from this analogy, are most people good or are most people bad? I think most people are generally good. I think Martin Luther King sort of proved that with how he went about his activism to end race, racism, racial discrimination. Um, And he did that by, Oh, I'm going to butcher the quote and I hate when I butcher it, but it was something like, um, you know, we will win you over with our capacity to suffer. And like, he did not go, go about affecting hearts and minds with violence. He went about it through peaceful, marches and peaceful protests that specifically elicited um, attacks from other people. And when normal, when normies, when the everyday, this is getting back to your point, when the, when everyday Americans saw this group attacking this other group that was being peaceful, that affected the hearts and minds of the average everyday person to see, you know, cause we innately see who the bad guy is. It's whoever's starting the fight, whoever's, whoever's attacking the peaceful people. That to me speaks to, I think most people are generally good. They they generally know who the bad guy is and what is right and wrong. I, I agree completely. I spent uh, just a little under 10 years as a cop and uh, worked in a jail, sixth largest jail system in the country for a while. So I got to be around a lot of people that had been locked up that most people would say were the worst of worst of society. Like the, they're that tiny percentage of the people that truly are bad. But even among those folks, very few, in my observation, were really bad. They were they were maybe a little bit rebellious, but uh, maybe they didn't go along with the uh, the way they should do things. Maybe they stole some fish. Maybe they pooped upstream. But this is they weren't really bad, and and they could be reasoned with. Not everybody, obviously. I'm not not that naive, but for the most part. I think there are very few really, truly bad guys out there. It's been my experience. I I just remembered that you used to be a cop. Now I want to interview you on my show about this. This is going to be a great conversation. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. So uh, you probably have a better window into it than I do. You have a professional uh, sort of opinion on it. 
Yeah. And I don't know that I know any more than you do about it because you've, you've experienced life just like I have. And, and quite frankly, as a cop, back when I was a cop, I would love it when you'd go to the spaghetti dinner fundraiser and the person up front would say, you know, all the, all the cops and military stand up. We would like to show you honor and for your bravery and protecting us. And uh, I, I would always just puff up my chest and stand up and look at my wife with pride in my eyes. But then later, as I became a more mature cop, I kind of realized, no, even in my little tiny town, the average response time was nine minutes. Mm. Anything scary was done by the time I got there. You know, once in eight years in the one agency, once in eight years, did I really grab a guy, his arm as he was getting ready to punch his wife. That was the only time that I really, truly protected somebody in eight years, cost about a hundred grand a year to put a cop on the street. So eight hundred thousand dollars it cost to keep her from getting punched. I mean, that's the the real good I did. So I, I don't know that I saw holy crap. <laughs> I, I didn't see that much bad. It was a small town, but it was still enough that even in the jail, it wasn't that bad. Uh, there there was a system that that things did kind of work, you know. And and I'm wondering if our listeners would be willing, I'm going to speak to directly to you guys instead of Patrick for a moment. There are some things that I hope we have completely fouled up and we have completely missed big hunks that we should have thought of. Uh, if you would go to letsthinkshow.com, get in touch and let us know, let me, let me know what, what's wrong? What, what am I missing? What, what are Patrick and I, what are we just completely glossing over? And then maybe in the future, I haven't asked Patrick this yet, but would you be willing to come on again and maybe address some of those things with me, Patrick? Oh man, I'm having the time of my life. We'll do this every day if you want, man. <laughs> Welcome back to the Let's Think Show. Would you be willing to come on again and maybe address some of those things with me, Patrick? Oh, man, I'm having the time of my life. We'll do this every day if you want, man. <laughs> awesome. Maybe we can even get Larkin to join us. He's sure. Like, like you said in a, a book forward I, I re- recently read that you wrote, he's just such a, a knowledgeable but humble guy. So, yeah, it, it, the questions that you guys have, uh, we want you to prove us wrong. Uh, our number, 406-646-6121. Uh, let's think show.com please be in touch and punch holes in uh, what it is that that we've been talking about and speaking of your show uh, let's get back a little bit tell me a little bit about you what uh, what kind of show do you have um, my, I, I have a couple shows. Uh, one is where we interview a bunch of uh, other voluntarists, a lot like what we're doing here, but maybe just more to sort of find out about them. That one's called Anarchast. Uh, that show has been running for, I think, um, almost six years now. I've, I was the, I became the host maybe seven, eight months ago now. So I've been doing that for a while. My long running show that I've been doing for six or seven years now is called Disenthrall. And that's where we talk. That's where we dive into the nerdy stuff like I was talking about. Like we, we get into philosophy from first principles and, you know, dive into the uh, ethics and logic of, of um, how to really figure out what it means to be evil or to have something be good or evil or right or wrong, things like that. Uh, and then go ahead. Interesting. Now, but you, and you said disenthrall. Tell me, uh, what does that mean? I'm not, I don't use that word much and I know, but in case I had to look it up. So yeah, yeah. for the others in, in the audience, it's probably a terrible name for a show because no one knows what it means, but a lot of times, <laughs> but, but a lot of times people go and look it up and then they figure it out. And now my show now it kind of is extra meaningful. So, uh, a thrall it is the root word, T-H-R-A-L-L. That is sort of someone that is under the control or spell of somebody else. So to enthrall okay. someone, E-N-T-H-R-A-L-L, is to place them under control or under that spell. And obviously disenthrall is to sort of break that spell, to wake people up. Okay. Okay. And now, 
just, don't I'm go out. there looking for non nerdy stuff. I'm just okay. saying <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be lighthearted stuff. This is our, and you know what? This is the this is the tough and and deep and challenging yet fun stuff. And I don't know about and I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but I I think that we're not kind of idiot dreamers that are wasting our time. I, I think it's a good idea to say, hey, this is what human beings have done. They said, we want to get from here to over there and walking is really tough and we have something really heavy to carry. What are some ideas about how we could make it easier? And then eventually somebody will come up with a wheel and then everybody loves it afterwards. So the airplane hadn't been invented until it was invented. And I love the idea that people like you are out there having these conversations and say, oh, let's punch holes in this idea. Let's come up with some ways that we might better organize society so that a third of what we earn isn't being stolen and we're not having nasty stuff happening and we're not being bossed around. I love that you're doing that. Thank you for it. Yeah, it's important to to build the foundation of uh, a series of ideas to make sure that the foundation is strong, you know, that it's sound. Uh, otherwise you have what happened to me and normal statism with that believes in the authority of the government, right? Like, um, some bad things happened to me from, uh, from the police. And so that led me to question where they got their authority. Where do they get the right to do this stuff to me? And I checked the foundation of sort of the belief in the government and the, you know, so-called just authority of the government. Guess what? Found out it's not really sound. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. So that led me to sort of look for what is sound. And, uh, well, that's what led me to volunteerism. That's the short version. Okay. Well, I am so glad that you're not only in voluntarism, but that you're also helping teach others or get them to question their, their thoughts and beliefs and, uh, and go even more. Uh, and, and by the way, and I'm not sure which of your uh, shows this was, but I listened to something the other day while I was uh, headed to work. It was awesome. There was a, a fun, uh, you had a birthday celebration or something. You were cooking steaks for the homeless. What, what was that whole project about? We have, I think, and this is a personal opinion, of course, but I pretty much can back it up mathematically. We have some of the best activists, street activists in the world here in Dallas, Texas, um, they don't do protests because protests are pointless most of the time. It's begging for permission from your leaders. They, the, your, your leaders love it when you beg. <laughs> right, <laughs> they want you right. to protest because it gets you to let off steam, but they don't actually <laughs> have to do anything. They just let you <laughs> yell in the streets. Um, so when I say street activism, that is not what I'm talking about. We do things where we, we, we find bad laws, immoral laws, like the law in Texas against feeding the homeless. And we set about breaking it as flagrantly and as loudly as possible. And we also um, make other statements about things like the second amendment. So uh, a lot of people will say the second amendment is for when the government turns tyrannical. And what do they do when somebody passes a law that, you know, infringes on their right to bear arms? Well, they go and they protest like they did in Virginia. <laughs> and they, they, put, they put on their guns on their back and then they march really angrily through the streets. And they, <laughs> they think that they taught the Virginia governor a, le a lesson. And then the next week, the governor just passes everything anyway. Oh, you know, and pats them on the head. You know, oh, right. oh you rowdy little citizens. Good job. I, I understand you're mad. You know, I've, I've listened. Thank you so much. It's so important that we have this discussion. Thank you for weighing in. Yeah, I, I'm listening. I hear you. And then I'm going to go literally do whatever I want anyway. Right. Uh, so what we do is we actually break the law. So we have various events. The big one is called Feed the Need. What I did for my birthday was just a miniature version of that. Uh, where we go out and we break the laws like the one against feeding the homeless. And we do it armed so that the police leave us alone because other groups have been arrested for doing it. And um, for, so I, I just did one for my birthday where uh, I, I, a lot of the homeless people, when they get donated food, it's usually just the quantity over quality stuff. It's pretty crappy. And uh, I love filet mignon. I think I, I I've worked for years Ooh. to be able to cook like the best bacon wrapped filet mignon you've ever put in your mouth. And so I just said, well, why can't we make, you know, why can't we go out and feed the homeless filet mignon? And so we did. And I got, oh, I got like a butcher shop on board. They donated a bunch of uh, cow and we went out and uh, we served filet mignon to a bunch of people armed because it was illegal. 
Right. So that's kind of one of the things that we did. And how many did you serve that day? I was so impressed. 150 uh, or up, something like that? That You had 150 steaks we, or something like that? We went there with 150. And I'm not talking about like Walmart quality filet mignon. I mean like the premium beef that I get from my butcher when I want to treat myself to a bacon wrap filet mignon. We went out there with 158 oh. ounce bacon wrap filet mignon. Wow. And uh, I, I, we didn't, we, we had too much meat. Like we had so much donated that we didn't even have enough mouths out there uh, to, wow. to, to, pull them, awesome. to put them in. That is yeah, awesome. This message is brought to you, by the way, by Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank Sorry. you. So- Sorry if you're sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, haven't, they haven't picked up this show just quite yet. Well, <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much for coming on today and chatting. And hopefully we'll get to do this again uh, soon. And, uh, you know, keep having, having folks punch holes in our ideas. And therefore, ide- our ideas will get better and better and better. So thank you very much. And by the way, websites, uh, let's toss those out. I'll also link them in the show notes. Uh, but if you want to tell us your websites or other ways to contact you, that'd be great. Yeah, if you want, uh, if you want in on the nerdy philosophy channel, it is disenthralled.me slash platforms, and you can find out all the places we publish too. And then if you're interested in parenting and learning about how to parent with some of the principles that we've discussed here, uh, I have created a online course or a series of lessons on peaceful parenting or principled parenting, as I call it, called peacefulparentinguniversity.com. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. And we will speak again soon. Excellent. I hope you got as much out of this conversation with Patrick as I did. Uh, you know, for a, a lot of years, and, and still, I, I wonder, uh, are there people out there that are willing to just kind of throw away all of the old dogma and, and keep good ideas, but explore new ones? And I have a feeling that out there listening right now, there's someone who isn't really getting what they need out of CNN or Fox News or Facebook or whatever. I have a feeling that somebody listening right now is saying, I'm looking for a group of people that even if we don't all agree, we're willing to talk. We're willing to explore new ideas. We'll challenge each other. We'll say, hey, wait, 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 wait. That doesn't make sense. That's not scalable or, well, yeah, that makes a great sense, but you're, you're only thinking about the ends. You're not thinking about the means. And this constant challenging of each other, that, that's, to me, the most important part of an intellectual friendship. It's fun to get along. I love, I love nice porters and brown ales, and that, that part's all wonderful of having a friend to hang out and and chat with, but it's really that intellectual honesty. And for me, the intellectual consistency of sticking with something, uh, sticking with an idea. And if you have a principle or a value, you stick with it until it's proven wrong. And then if it is, you admit it and you say, holy cow, I no, that doesn't make sense. This thing I've thought for so long No, it doesn't make sense. I've got to rethink this. I I think that's just the the way we should go as as human beings. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Hopefully, there's something here that's helping you. I would love to know if it is. If you have ideas about future shows or or how we can we can better meet your needs. 406-646-6121. That's the Let's Think Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we will look forward to hearing your ideas at 406-646-6121. And of course, seeing you again in one week next Saturday night here on 1360 KHNC. Coming up next, Administrative Static.